<laughs> now don't worry, so these four men can see you if you could identify the one <laughs> that committed the crime. <laughs> it's the one on the right, I guess. How about you? My right or Okay, well, welcome to this Skills of the Workplace Forum. Completely new to try. Uh, we've been asked by the university to put this on and see how it works. Uh, I'm just going to introduce these four brilliant blokes who said that they're going to talk to you today and answer all your questions, no matter what they are. Uh, <laughs> as long as they don't crash the bounds of new human decency, and I do not mean Matt Trout's human decency. <laughs> Okay, so we have, first of all, Mr. Dave Cross. Uh, Dave's been working in IT for over 20 years. Really? I just said 20 years. But he's spent the last 15 years as a freelancer. It means he's got to see quite a lot of workspaces. He also runs training courses on code with his company, Magnum Solutions, who did some workplaces today. And he started London PM. He said he's really sorry about that. <laughs> he's also been confused with being a borough of London, I think to everybody concerned in the world of Twitter. Are you the borough of London, a certain borough of London? I'm sure you are. Maybe. Like Green Hill, State Cross. <laughs> Every Bogle is one of the founders of Property Search Engine Nestoria, which runs entirely on Pearl. It serves about 2 million users a month. Prior to that, he worked for many years at Yahoo Europe. Well done for a in there. Over the years, he's hired and managed about 50 engineers at various skill levels. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, he's hired 50 engineers. I don't know if they left because they didn't like him a lot, or whether it's in the attractiveness of his bid, they just couldn't keep their hands up and he had to get rid of them. Um, he has an MBA from MIT. So I'm going to read you up later. Um, Curtis Poe, uh, with a wonderful haircut. This is new. Is it? Is it? Is this, uh, <laughs> But the Pope Foundation, <laughs> you lose all your hair that quick. Uh, Beyonce has something to do with it. Okay, Curtis Obi Poe sits on the Pope Foundation Board of Directors. He's authored numerous articles on Pearl, including co authorship of O'Reilly's Pearl Hacks book. He's frequently invited to speak about Pearl at various conferences and is currently focused on complexity management in large scale systems. I would like to see more universities offer Pearl courses, I think, along with all of us. And I'm in the movement. Amit has been a development manager architect at Vendor, where for the last seven years he's taken on the key roles and projects to grow the company from a startup with a handful of clients to the world's leading provider of SAAS e commerce, running sites for major clients such as Tesco, Superdrug, and the British Museum. His interests include data visualization and usability. You really shouldn't admit to things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm really just going to open this up to all of you. So, stick your hand up and ask a question. Come on, hands. This is your part. In order to do this, you have to put your hand up in some way. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of trained on the audience. Can you give us some idea of themes? Oh, well, the theme is skills in the workplace. It's anything to do with any skill in the workplace, what you need as a developer, or what, what are they looking for. Each of these four men has either worked with very large teams, or as consultants, or actually run teams. So they can tell you basically what, what they would be looking for as a developer. So we have a couple of people straight away. Ian. What's been your biggest non-technical challenge? <laughs> well, for me it was motherhood, but... <laughs> um, are you talking about for individuals here, or the sort of biggest non-technical challenge that one tends to get? In your, in your own experience, in, in your work environments, uh, over the years, as the biggest non-technical challenge in this industry is the fact that programmers are often difficult people. <laughs> um, they're often very socially inept. I'm sorry, going to be blunt. Many of them are socially inept. Some of them are, you know, socially great. Some of them don't have the greatest hygiene skills. Uh, some of them argue quite a bit uh, because they are just fantastic at what they do. Some of them are really awful at what they do and they don't understand. And that's the, I think, biggest non-technical challenge which I generally see cropping up from company to company. Just the nature of the sort of people that kind of get attracted to this work. It's kind of like a uh, cat curtain. 
Could, couldn't you say the same thing about like marketing, except it's a different kind of people? But no, they, they're 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 not, they have nice clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so, anybody want to follow up on them being all obnoxious and smelly? <laughs> Well, just to follow, kind of follow up on that, I, in the work I've done, you know, we build websites and things. That technically has been solved. Like, it's not a technical challenge to build a website, right? I mean, you, you're, there may be fine points to the project that make it more or less interesting, but um, it's not a technical challenge. The hard part is always working with the people, and that's both within the engineering team, or also the engineering team interacting with other groups. Um, I don't know, we, we say when we hire people, we always want people with three skills. So first of all, we want people, especially for engineers, people who are smart, so of course they need to be good at that. They need to be hardworking. But very much equally important to both of those are, do they have a thick skin? Are they able to deal with the uncertainties that happen in real life? So whether the data is always crap, and that's just a reality, we're gonna have to deal with it. Or the business side comes with bizarre you know, requirements at the last minute, and that's a reality, because that's what we need to do to make money, or whatever. Um, and very often, not every engineer is very well placed to deal with that type of situation. And I think that's the differentiator between someone who's, someone can be a very good developer, and that's not the same thing as being very good, a good programmer within a team and an organization and succeeding within that organization. You were a lot more polite about that than I was. <laughs> well, the hygiene thing is an important one as well. I'll, I can't <laughs> emphasize that enough. Okay, so Jess, you held your hand up. Do you have a question? Um, yeah, I wonder if there's any hints for somebody who's a programmer like moving up to take over a team. Not necessarily one they've worked in, maybe a completely separate one, and how they feel about sort of placing themselves, you know, making themselves respected for the new team or something. I mean, like going in with a huge stick. <laughs> <laughs> but other, other than a huge stick, more respect rather than fear, possibly. <laughs> Um, one thing that in, in groups of, of, of geeks more than almost anywhere else is that it's often seen as a meritocracy in as much as you know, they're, they're happy to follow somebody if that, that, if that someone has proven that they right. are, te are technically skilled. Uh, and, and are able to um, guide them in that way. So that would be one, be very good. Right. <laughs> Anybody else got any well, for me, I would say the number one thing in any relationship, be it with people you're managing or your bosses or whatever, is managing expectations. So uh, we have a saying in our business, bad news is fine, no surprises. So what people hate are surprises. They hate that you all of a sudden come and say, like, you know, we're going to do this totally differently, or these requirements change, or whatever. But if you come to the beginning and say, you know what, this project is uncertain, and there's a chance later on the requirements may change, so let's contemplate what we're going to do about that in the beginning. Then people, you know, it's bad news if the requirements change later, but at least it's not that anticipated. So I think it's all about, in every relation, it's about managing expectations, and being open with people and saying, look, here's what I expect, here's why it's the way it is, so let's adapt and figure out how we're going to deal with that. But one, one, one thing you, that you do find is that if, you, um, if you've been in a job for a long while or you've been in the industry for a, a long while, people generally just expect you to move up into some kind of team leadership or management position. And, and the skills that you need to do that are, are completely different to the skills that you need in order to be a good programmer. And so you have to, well, first, first of all, you have to find out whether that's something that the programmer really wants to to do, um, because it, it, just because someone's been doing the, the the job for a long time, they might not necessarily want to move into that kind of role, and it might be more appropriate to move them into some kind of um, technical architecture role or or, or 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 something like that. But if the programmer does want to do that, and, and the company wants them to do that, then you have to, you have to insist that there is um, support for the person going into the completely new role and maybe getting some sort of training in, 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 the, in the new skills that are going to be needed. Because you can't expect to take a programmer and just dump them in as a team leader and for them to be good at, at, at that job.
partly expected Curtis to say, bring them soap and clean clothes. <laughs> um, if I can add to that, the other thing you should always do with running any team is give them more respect than you expect them to give you. You'll find out they like you a lot more. And don't sort of think that you will make weird pictures of your wallet, not as much. They don't show them to you and parade them around the office. Um, any more questions? Have you found good ways to balance the conflict between people wanting to keep on top of technology instead of today and at the same time deliver and be productive? I can answer that. One of the best things you can use for that, believe it or not, is have a ticket tracking system, particularly one which allows you to track your time rather than an arbitrary thing but in a specific slot. So that later on, one of the problems you have is you suggest a brand new feature in management. Management often says, oh wow, that's really cool. I, I never thought about making the button moo like a kitten when you moo like a cow. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they go off and do it. They, they let you go off and do it. But if you say, I really need to refactor the XML builders because they're horrible, they're awful, it's taking a lot of time. And they say, well, well no, no, we got these new features. What you want is cost benefit analysis, and it's very, very difficult to do. Um, and if you get the time track, and you can say, well, we spent this amount of time in the past trying to work on this and trying to solve it. These are the bugs we've had. You know, even if you can't figure out the cost because you don't know how much it costs, you can lay out this over time and say, this is the amount of time it has cost us to deal with this issue, and this is the amount of time it's going to take me to actually fix this issue. So, so that could be, you know, converting over to Moose, for example, instead of your hand-rolled OO system. And as, w and this is the time it's going to save us in the future. Um, there's a lot more to cost-benefit analysis than that, um, but that at least gives you a way of presenting a business case to them where they can know, oh, we're actually going to make money. The downside for them is what's the opportunity cost? What am I not delivering at this time while he's off doing that thing? So you, when you talk to business, you have to talk to them about business. You really have to become a bit of a salesman and you know, go and sell this project to the different people who are going to do it. So it's quite a tough thing. The way we always think about it is whenever you go to your boss, never go with the problem, go with the solution. <laughs> uh, this sounds like a good way to actually sell it, for example, to my team members, why they should keep tracking time. So, I can give them the this gun in their hands, so if you track your time, you can actually tell me this one is costing me much too much. You can estimate individual velocity a lot better if uh, time is being tracked on a regular basis. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to tracking time, but the reality is you're not going to do it. We know that. No one here is going to do it. Well, correction. 95% of you probably are not going to be tracking your time, even though there are a lot of benefits, because it's boring. At Brain Track, it was easy. You checked into a ticket, and that started your timer when you were done. You marked the ticket as done. That stopped the timer. It wasn't terribly accurate, but we had a rough idea. We come back from lunch and click on the ticket again. Ooh, we've got a rough idea how long it takes us. It was easy that way. In the current area, I was going back to that. It is definitely like the programmers using use a tool that they hate for these rich days. It's like, well, I'm sure you and I can think of Jera. <laughs> because otherwise, they just plain won't. Uh, we had a question here. Um, so I've got a lot of kind of questions around the group, but I'll try and take a simple bit out of it. Um, I find if I'm doing things at work or things in my personal life, if, if I can give myself a to-do list or some kind of checklist to work to, I can normally stress less because I know I haven't forgotten things and I can prioritise better and I can make sure that I've got the things done that I needed to do. Do you have any, any, do you have any techniques, methods, tricks that you use to going into a piece of work that you haven't done yet to, to have an idea of what sort of things you're going to need to, apart from experience, ways of scoping up where you're going to need to put time and how you're going to prioritize it? I start with a port finished Glen Morangy. <laughs> 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 Do I have any colleagues here? I mean, I think the only way is experience. So it's either your yeah. experience or someone else's experience. If you don't have that experience, then you're, you need to find someone who does. So well, it's it's like an external consultant or whatever. 
It's not something you can really teach the people, is it? I'm trying to like, find ways to get guys to, without them having the experience. But I've, I've, I find, as a, a freelancer, going into a new code base every six months, three months, whatever, that it, very soon you're into a, a you're, you, you, know, you have a grace period of a couple of weeks when you first get there, but then you're in a, a situation where you're in a sprint planning meeting and, and, and this needs to happen, uh, how long is it going to take? And it's a piece of code that you haven't actually seen, and, and, and so there's no way of you knowing many, many of the things that you need to know about that code in order to answer that question. The, the, the only option that I've learned at, at that stage is, is, is that you, you just have to ask people that, 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 that know the code base. I mean, I, I've got lots of generalized experience where you know, once I understand the problem, I know how long it's going to take, but, but because I, I, I have no idea how what, what the code base is going to look like on a scale of, you know, from, from great to crap. If I can throw in that situation, the last, if I, let's say we hired you as a contractor and we asked you how long this is going to take, the, the worst thing you could do is say it will take one week without yeah, knowing. Exactly. You know, yes. It's much better if you say, you know what, I don't know, I'll have an answer for you tomorrow. Yep. And because otherwise, I, if you say one week, again, it's about managing expectations, then I think it's going to be one week, and then the next day you come and you say it's going to be four weeks. Now I'm angry. <laughs> so. On, on a related to that, something I've experienced, which I found very awkward, is when um, someone comes to you with, this is what needs to be done, you know, in a week, how long will it take you? And it may be a two week thing, and they don't want to hear that, you know, it's, it's more than a week's work. And sometimes you find yourself almost compromising. If I do this and this and this and this, you can have it in a week. And you almost feel like you're selling it, so maybe you can do it in a week still. But you might be working longer than your, your normal stack of hours or whatever. And I think a lot of developers do that, but it's bad. How do people deal with that? That's about building up trust between you and the business. Isn't it? it's, um, it's in, that comes in a situation where um, the business have had a history of, of getting estimates from the developers that have proved to be wrong. And so they then start saying, this needs to be done by this date. Uh, and, and, and which gets you into a situation where you're then working ridiculous hours or something. So the, I think at the heart of solving that issue is to spend however long <coughs> it takes to actually improve your estimation skills in the team. So that when you give an estimate to the business, they know they can trust that. And this is the process that we've just gone through, um, the place where I'm currently working, and we, we now know, or the, the business know, that, it, that when we say this is going to take, take us two weeks, it's not because it's, it's a big thing and we're just guessing. It's because we've thought it through and, and, and the estimates that we give them are um, accurate. We had I, don't, a, we, I don't think it's the, it's, it's the business, I, I don't think it's in the inaccuracy in, in estimates given previously. It's, it's, it's business wanting something to be which which isn't. You know, they want it for their own reasons by when. And well, okay. maybe sometimes you should just say no. One technique I have to use do it by with when. that, if it's feasible in your situation, I don't know, I don't know the nature of your tasks, is you know if I say okay, I break it down, I you know this task, this task, this task, I add up you know all of my ideal time, um, and then I multiply that by two, literally. You know, if I'm doing you know, separate estimates or split planning. And then I say, okay, it's going to take this amount of time. That's my estimate. And they say, no, it's got to be done in half that. Okay, yeah, that's not a problem. Don't worry about that. Um, which features do you want to pull out? I can do it if I pull out this feature or that feature or the other feature. Um, so you never tell them no, but you always say, you know, which bits do you want to cut? And make sure that when one thing I've done before, you didn't hear this. One trick I've often used when dealing with that actually is I'll talk, sometimes I'll just point out features anyway, and I will toss in features that I know they're going to not want. And <laughs> that at least gives them a chance to feel like they're having some control over the situation. You don't think you don't think it's the use of deleting features. Yes. <laughs> Which means they may at some point can actually delete something that makes it look like it sucks. So no, this is talking about managing their expectations as much as your time. Yes. Yeah. Any more questions?
Can you tell us a little bit about um, your experience with uh, telecommuting, working from home, the, the challenges you have to face and the experience you have to that? It sucks. <laughs> a lot of people love it. Um, I find that I need social contact. Uh, I can do telecommuting you know, one, two days a week, but after a while. When I was living back in the States, it was okay because a whole bunch of telecommuters got down to a particular uh, coffee shop to check free Wi-Fi, and that became our virtual office. But aside from that, um, I don't like sitting at home all day, every day, at a computer from you know 7 in the morning to you know whatever time. It just killed me. I think that gets to the point of, yeah, so first I also hate telecommuting, but some people love it. So the reality is different people work well in different ways. Um, so one thing we think about is, especially in things where, projects where I don't really have any control over how the engineer does it or, or things like that, or if they want to work from home or not, I, I don't even try to. Instead of having the illusion of saying, you need to be in the office from these hours to these hours, I'm going to try to say, look, how long is this going to take? We come to a conclusion on when the, the, the deliverable is, and I say, how you do it is up to you. If you want to work from home, fine, work from home. If you want to, you know, if you want to outsource the project, outsource the project. I don't care as long as we get to, I don't even have the illusion of trying to like manage people's micro details. That's just a waste of time. I think it's quite important to have checkpoints where, where you've got something that's, um, that's ready for other people to look at and, and make sure that everybody's looking at it if you are working Otherwise you can sort of drift off for several days and Doesn't anyone else find that if they are working from home, that daytime TV just becomes far more fascinating? <laughs> <laughs> nope, it means that you're working for. <laughs> can, I, can I throw an alternative perspective on that? I actually like that. I used to do it fairly consistently. Things I've found are one, have an office that's nowhere near the TV, or the fridge, or the kettle, so you have to make a conscious effort to take a break and walk and do things rather than just go on the TV. Uh, and I find that uh, it's, now I'm back working in office again. I find that the thing telecommuting is useful for is when I have to get something done, and I need to be in the zone and stay back. The oh, yes. thing yes. with office yes. is yes. that there are interruptions, and it can take you, if you're one of these people, it takes half an hour to get in the zone, then one interruption basically kills half an hour of COVID, plus whatever it is. So yeah. if I've got something I need to get finished, I would quite well ask if I can work from home to finish it. And they do all those things that stop me being distracted by things at home. Yeah. Leave space for the cat. Sorry? Leave space for the cat if you're at home. <laughs> because if you <laughs> don't, it will stop you working. And also kill things like IRC and kinds of ways of stopping yourself browsing the web. I think we have. Yeah. Uh, following on from that, uh, I, I find that um, in the, in the, from the point of view of getting stuff done, uh, I, I work much better at home. Uh, but the part of that is that uh, working uh, very funny hours that don't fit in with the office thing. So, um, uh, do, you, do you have any advice on uh, how, how to uh, make, make the transition to, to doing such completely outsourced freelance stuff rather than having to go into an office? Do you, have you read the book, The Four Hour Work Week? No. Buy that book. He <laughs> explains exactly how to convince your boss out that you should work from home. <laughs> the four hour work week. That's just oh. stage one of the book. Well, well, that's just stage one. But again, it's. Uh, you won't convince them if you tell them the title of the book. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's about going to your boss with a solution, not, uh, if not with a problem. Instead of saying, my problem is I can't concentrate here, go and say, you know what, this project X, I'm going to have it done faster if I work from home. So that's part of the solution. The thing about working um, different work hours to the, um, to the rest of the office, from my point of view as a freelancer going into your office, and whether I'm working from home or um, going into the office, whilst I'm feeling my way around the code base, I need to have access to the people who are the experts in the, in the, in the code base during the hours that I'm working. And, you know, I'm boring, I like to work 9 to 5. Um, so I would need to find some way that I could, at, at, at some point during the afternoon perhaps, have access to somebody who actually really wants to work from 4 o'clock in the morning to midday or something. It's a huge issue with distributed developments as well, it's time zones. 
<laughs> yeah, that's the same thing, I suppose. Yeah, so uh, if you have somebody back eight hours and somebody forward 12 hours, it's a day between yeah, information. Um, it can be a headache. But for managers, it's a case of getting used to waiting 48 hours for any real answer. Right, more questions? What's your favourite way of organising a team? So, you groups, pairs, how would you deal with this sort of grouping up? I guess it completely depends on the task in hand. Um, where I am currently, we have, uh, I suppose, a dozen developers, of which maybe a quarter of them are front end and the rest of them are, are, are back end. There's quite a big split between the front end people and the back end people. And now, um, at the moment, a large number of those are carved off to be working on some new um, Blue Sky project that's going to be going live and, they, and a, a smaller group of us are set aside to do um, basically keeping the business running type, type of work. But it's all very flexible and um, it's just on top of the um, weekly sprint planning there's, I suppose there's, there's a larger um, long term view that this, we're going to be working in these two particular sprints for three months whilst this big project goes on. But if that big project needs more people to come in, then people move across quite easily. There's, there's nothing particularly um, set in, in stone. It's all very flexible according to what the, the week-to-week needs are. Regarding pairing, that's a very hit or miss thing that goes back to the social skills of many developers. Uh, one company I worked for, there was one person no one would pair with because he explained everything he did in such pedantic detail that you literally fell asleep while pairing with him. I've done that before with him more than once and I finally just stopped with myself. Another gentleman uh, would get bored and play his uh, Game Boy while you're coding. Uh, another guy had such hideous bad breath that I never wanted to. We worked out a deal where we each had screen and we could sit at office at ends of the office and pair together. Um, so now for pairing, I will pair very, very briefly. If there's a horrible problem that I need solved, I can't figure it out, or you know, for them vice versa, and we just need to brainstorm a particular thing, but or need to train a new person on something. But aside from that, pairing. Yeah. When new developers recruited, what percentage of work time should be contributed to them learning, learning the system and the business and the, the specs? Um, how much should you just let them go and find out for themselves? I guess it kind of depends on your depends on your focus and your project. I guess at uh, Vendor we have a three month initiation. But the, the developer is um, productive and working on real code you know, so in, in a few weeks in. Um, <laughs> we have some sort of training, we've got a you know, thing, but, uh, but mainly we've got to dig in and, and, and try some stuff out. And maybe you solve a few bugs, that's always a good way. Are you talking about movies or, or contractors on the project? I think you can that person. It really depends on the system. Tiny systems, you can learn pretty darn quickly. Uh, the system I work on now, I've been on it for two years, and there are still bits and pieces of it that I don't know. That every time I touch them, it's miserable. So it just really depends. I mean, we spend a lot of time in our business trying to make sure that our system, that our team is easy to join because we work quite a bit with students and contractors or people like that who we know are just going to come in for a three month period or six month period so if we need to spend a month training them that's a, that's a huge waste so we try to have very clean interfaces between systems so that someone can come in and you know by the end of the first week they're actively working on, on one of our key systems you know, probably only that one system and then over time they'll learn more but but, uh, yeah. but that's just part of the code design process I've got a nice example for that um, a while ago I worked at Sun uh, working on Solaris kernel code, and obviously that's a very big system, but uh, I found working on that could be productive pretty much straight away because it's highly modularized, 
um, it's concerned they've got very clean APIs. Okay. So this is also an area where pairing can can help. Um, I've been at places where the, uh, someone new joins and they'll basically be missed off the sprint planning for two, maybe three weeks. And during that time, they'll just pair with various people as they're doing interesting and useful things, which gets them into large numbers, large, uh, lots of corners of the code base quite quickly. How many days a year should a typical programmer spend away from the office on courses? <laughs> as many as possible. <laughs> What's the minimum to maintain your craft? We, the way we do it is we, uh, each, every person in our company, not just developers, has a, you know, there's a certain percentage of your budget that you have for training. And we, you know, the last thing I want to do is send someone to a course that they're not interested in, so that's wasted money. But we do heavily encourage everyone to think about how, are you, what, what skills are you going to learn in the next quarter? And what training is that going to take? Is it going to be, you're going to go to a conference, or you're going to go, because we, if we don't train people, eventually they're going to get fed up and they're going to quit. And they're going to say, I'm not learning anything. So I'd rather train them. Not, and also, of course, that keeps them current so that they're a better contributor to the business. But. Do they have a budget, some roughly how much? Yeah, it's yeah. like 5% of your salary or something. Like your annual salary. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any tips for dealing with managers who, even though they've been like high up managers for quite a long time, they're real technical meddlers and they, they spend like lots of hours in every afternoon and evening messing with code and they're always too busy to deal with management issues? Any, any way to? Well, demote them to the <laughs> shop they really want. Well, when you're, you're just working for them or under them. To be honest, the be in many cases, the best, the, the, the best answer is to find a, a new job. Oh, Find another job, I'll get a gun. <laughs> I, I had a, I, one particular job I had recently, well, a few, a few, a few years ago. I would um, come in every morning to find that the CTO had gone home at about 2 o'clock in the morning, having, having completely undone everything that I'd done in the previous day. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't last long. <laughs> How do you create a productive work environment? Obviously, the time is moving on there, but open plans can be a bit more than having your own office set up and think of luxury. And how do you create a productive work environment for your staff or what would you consider to be a productive work environment? I think one of the most important things there, and a lot of companies seem to miss this over and over again, give them very strong, understandable, short, medium, and long term goals. Um, I see a lot of teams, they just drift, and it's very difficult to get focused on what you're doing if you don't know what you're doing. <clears throat> because there's so many projects, they're not a classic death march, but they're a boring march. You're doing the same thing day in, day out, no end in sight, there's no point. Um, like, there's one company in London, you show up in a, I won't name them, but you show up in user groups here, and you hear about their code. And I know there's a number of good programmers. The company sounds nice, the employees are great, the uh, pay is reasonable, but I know a number of people who will refuse to work for them because their code is just so, it, it has a reputation. Um, and it doesn't sound like that's something they're going to get out of. So it's a sort of thing where you're just working and working and working. You want a strong goal, you want to get people enthused about this goal, to buy into it and keep. Uh, so they know what they're working for. You know, you go home and your partner says, what did you do today? Same thing. <laughs> or, oh, I implemented this thing which is going to help us get closer to the launch of this revolutionary new product, or, you know, cleaned up this part of the code base, or just something which long term they can get excited about, can keep excited about. And everything can get, I think, should ultimately be driven off that, and you can self-organize better and get them productive once they know what they're getting productive for. Maybe you have a question down there? Yeah. Um, many developers have a uh, better way of learning things. And in many cases, it's learning by doing something in your life, learning new technology by trying and doing a project with new technology. So, do you have any advice on how to improve your skills by 
while working in a very conservative environment, where non new technologies yes. I don't ask permission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Yeah. But, I mean, if you're in that environment and you know there's no chance that it's ever going to be deployed in the production code, then you don't want to be in that environment. Don't contract you. <laughs> you know, if I had ever asked my boss to, if I may use scary stuff like inline Python at work, <laughs> he would have shot me down. Well, in my but case, I did not ask him if it does work, so he's fine with it. My HTTO is probably modules installed on the server, so I <laughs> <coughs> Any advice for um, encouraging colleagues to write more maintainable code? <laughs> <laughs> Force them. Define maintainable. Um, test weeks, documentation, um, clean API, that kind of thing. Demand that people work on other people's code and read other people's code. I mean, as soon as you've had to fix somebody else's code, it isn't well tested or documented. You hope that you start to write more maintainable code yourself. One thing I've seen um, work regarding documentation and tests and, 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 and things like that is to um, pull some measure of that into your continuous integration server. If, 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 if something that your um, continuous integration process does is to um, pull in all the pod from the modules and create a documentation website, um, and all it starts off with is a list of module names and you can pull any of them and it's an empty file, um, that pretty soon gets people thinking maybe we should um, have some more of that. And, all, and, the, same, and the same if you're, if you're using something like um, Devil Cover to, um, to, to, to measure the coverage of your, of your test. If, if, if suddenly there's a publicly or an, an internally accessible website that says you have test coverage of three per, 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 per cent, then that's a, um, in, an incentive to increase that. It's the same basis that so many thousands of games were raising numbers. People loved it. Give people Game numbers. Number give people numbers. Yeah. Yes. Um, you could, for, 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 for other things, you could even, um, and you know, this is a bit contentious perhaps and dangerous, but um, you can start running test, test um, running Perl Critic against the checked in code base and produce stats about what code has the highest number of test critic um, failures and things like that. Give people a, a numbers game to, to play. They'll find a way to game it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can always lower the incentive for the person to choose the lowest score each week by the first round of drinks. It's all quite yeah. And if you start it off by you buy the first round of drinks, you set it up. The structural thing that can help is um, not su not um, separating support and development. If you separate support and development so that you know, there are a load of people writing bugs and there's a completely different group of people fixing bugs, <laughs> <laughs> then, um, you know, that sounds fun. <laughs> okay, we're on to a last question or so. Yeah, uh, you are hiring somebody. Uh, which is skill, apart from Perl, of course, you will be looking for technically and not technically, more than kind of soft skill. Ability to communicate with people. Ability to communicate with people. Number one skill. So. Did you say what technical or non technical? One technical. Yeah. One, 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 you know, acronym perhaps. And then something, something like, I mean, a program language, whatever, very good thing, really, really helpful. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that's what I love to see because it really clears up a lot of problems once you apply it to the database and simplify things. That's that's a very good choice, but to, uh, to choose something else, um, I think I'd look for evidence of um, curiosity about technical matters in the, the CV. Have they been learning new programming languages? Have they been teaching themselves stuff? That kind of note, I think um, if you if you have, have people who um, look one layer above and one layer below the area that they're working in, at least. Um, so I mean, I guess if they're working in a web app, they know a little bit more about databases, they know a little bit about bug system access and I/O. Yeah. 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 I think also the ability for them to learn in the area they're in. Um, <coughs> Particularly young people applying for a catalyst job who never been onto an IRC, never read a mailing list, never looked at the docs, but they worked with catalyst in a previous job, but they've done anything except what they did in a previous job and gone, that framework I know with them, because I did it with this previous job, I'd worry about employing them. In fact, we probably wouldn't. Um, as, a, as a developer, and you want, if you want developers in any big project, you really need to be committing or be committed to that project or those frameworks or languages. You should be looking at doing that, looking at being part of the community as well. It will enhance your communication. Right, well, I'd like to thank all four of the speakers today who've given up their time. So, could I have a large round of applause?